don't want to preach a whole other message from what the Lord has put in my heart. So can we turn to Zechariah chapter 1? This has really been on my heart. You know when the Lord's really speaking to you when you can't sleep. Yeah. You know, you want to, you're going over it and over it because God is, is speaking to you. Um, and so I think I've shared some of this before in a rise meeting. Uh, but I, I really want to get it in depth today because the Lord really put this in my heart. Uh, Zechariah chapter, we, we could read from verse 1, but I don't really want to because I want to chapter quickly, Zechariah chapter 1. I don't want to read the whole uh, chapter, although it would be great to do that. I just want to pick up, say from verse 12. And Zechariah was a prophet who was uh, involved in the restoration after the exile to Babylon. And he was a prophet who got all these really symbolic, uh, prophetic symbols in his message, in his book. And it, it takes a lot of study and a lot of revelation to figure out what the guy's saying. Um, and it's, it's quite, but he's a very important, they call these guys the minor prophets, but he's a very important prophet. Yeah. And a, a lot of these minor prophets filled in details and gaps, if you like, almost, uh, that the major prophets would speak about, these people would fill in uh, details. So I don't like calling them the minor prophets because they're prophets. Amen. Um, but anyway, verse 12, The angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you were angry these 70 years? Let's put that into modern day terms and say, How long, Lord, before, and we just sang it. Yeah, how, long? how long before you return to Scotland in mighty power? Right. You say, well, we don't deserve it. I got rebuked once by a man. He's a friend of mine, but um, bound by a religious spirit. Yeah. And, uh, oh, you can't ask God to bless the nation. Yeah. We don't deserve it. I said, well, when did we ever? When did we ever deserve it? And in fact, the blessing is that we don't deserve it, and he does it anyway. Exactly. Anyway, he, he accepted that. I don't know that he's still bound, but anyway. <laughs> Against which you were angry these 70 years. Well, you know, I think God is, is not very happy with Scotland. Yeah. And um, so, but we can pray this, how long, Lord? It's a lot more maybe than 70 years yeah. since we've seen uh, a mighty movie. And you say, well, there's a Lewis revival. Well, that's around about 70 years now, isn't it? So, good timing. And the Lord answered the angel who talked to me, say, with good and comforting words. That's what we need to hear, isn't it? Good and comforting words. But we also need to hear a rebuke. Yeah. Amen? And, and, and God will deliver both. Anyway, I'm... I'm oops. <laughs> Thank you. I just hope I don't get all my notes jumbled up now, because then it's going to be quite a disjointed message. Praise the Lord. Anyway, he says, I am proclaimed, saying, so the angel with, who spoke with me said to me, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord of hosts. And what I want us to notice here, folks, before we go any further is, how many times the Lord says, referring to himself, and in this passage, but also throughout Scripture, that he is the Lord of hosts? Yeah. Because Yahweh Sabbath. Not Yahweh Sabbath, but Yahweh Sabbath. And what he's telling us is, I've got legions of angels at my beck and call, and, and to activate them, you need to, you need to be speaking my word. You, you, you and I don't boss angels around. I don't like that teaching. But what we can do is speak God's word and he will. In fact, the angels are programmed. Let's just put it that way. This is part of the technology of heaven. The angels are programmed that when they hear the word of God, they go and act on it and implement what you say. So you're, you're designed to speak God's word and they're designed to immediately launch out and act on it. And when you say things against God's word, they just stand with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And say, when will this dummy ever live? Mm -hmm. 
Amen? That, I, I had that experience when, when Satan uh, appeared to me and I was uh, on the ground completely paralyzed with fear and uh, my angel, I turned around, my angel was standing behind me. This was a long time ago. And, and I, I don't know if I ever I said to him, I was just thinking, why aren't you helping me here? Because I came out of my body and, I, and Satan was, was there. And, and the angel just pointed over my shoulder. I shared this the other night uh, in our loving fountain meeting. And, um, and then the, 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 the dust in front of me was a gleaming sword and I picked it up. And You see, the angels wait for us to take this sword and release it. Amen. If the angels fought all your battles for you, without you doing that, then what would be the point of obedience? What would be the point of speaking the word? Anyway, I'm not going to get into all that. I need to stick to it. Because again, it's a whole other message. The Lord of hosts. And notice here it says he's jealous. Uh, the, The New King James says he's zealous. And the new king, sorry, the King James says he's jealous. Same thing. He's jealous that we would uh, put him first, obey him. Verse 15 says, I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease, for I was a little angry, and they helped but with evil intent. God is angry with the nations. I believe God's angry with the nations right now because of what's happening. The nations can fulfill God's purpose in judgment. The the Lord was using the nations against uh, Judah. And and God did that. He allowed uh, Israel and Judah to come into bondage to the heathen nations. We don't hear that word a lot now, heathen. But, you know, the non-Israel nations to bring his nation Israel, Judah, back to him. But they went way beyond what God intended. That's what he says here. He says you had evil intent. They went beyond his intentions. The intention of God was that they be chastised. But they went way beyond that. And so he was angry with them. And I believe that's what's happening today. We've been chastised the last couple of years as the church and really it was designed, I believe, to get, a, to get us licked into shape again. To, to become fervent uh, prayer warriors, intercessors, uh, and more than that, decreers of God's word. But I look around, I don't see that people have responded to that. Mm-hmm. Then it says, verse 16, Therefore thus says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. That's a message we need to hear. We need the mercy of God because... Without it, and look, look at this phrase. Remember that mercy triumphs over judgment. A lot of people revel in judgment, don't they? Christians, so-called Christians, they revel in the judgment of God. Oh, God is judging us. They take some kind of glee in that. But the Bible says mercy triumphs over judgment. Yeah. God's heart is to be merciful, but judgment is what he will use in his mercy. But look at this. My house shall be built in it. My house will be built in Jerusalem. And we could say today, my house will be built in the church. Now, we're not talking about, and and, and I'm going to be controversial here, we're not talking about every believer. Mm -hmm. We're talking about remnant saints. God's building his house in the midst of it all. In the midst of Laodicean Christianity. Yeah. In the midst of PC Christians. That's right. In the midst of so-called woke Christians, which is really an oxymoron. Because mm. you can't be woke and be a Christian. Mm. But I tell you this, you can be awake. Mm-hmm. And God is looking for us to seek and hunger to be awakened. Yeah. My house will be built in it. You can actually even say that he's... He, he, that his house will be built in mercy. Mm-hmm. Says again that name, the Lord of hosts. And a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. And that's a whole different message, but we'll, we'll, we'll leave that there. But look at verse 17. This is a bit I like. 
Hallelujah. <laughs> again proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, again that name, My cities shall again spread out through prosperity. Oh dear. He just lost half the church. <laughs> Amen. All those, oh, prosperity, that's not of God. But he says it will be done through prosperity. Amen. So that tells me, as taking this as a prophetic word, the, the, the message of kingdom wealth is going to be big Amen. in the church that's, that's, that God is rising up right now. Yep. Amen? Yep. So you might not like it, but you're going to have to get uh, watching your YouTube videos of Kenneth Copeland and Jerry Savell and learn about prosperity because he says it's going to be done through prosperity. Right. You see, the fall of Babylon, which we're going to look at, it's a wealth transfer event. Mm -hmm. The wealth will go from the wicked to the just. And if you're the just, it'll go to you. And if you don't like that, then Give you'll not me. walk in it. Give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> my cities. And I, I would put that there. I would say my churches. A little bit of license there. Yeah. Okay? Because the Bible says appoint elders in every city. Yeah. And churches are linked with cities, aren't they? in the New Testament. Towns and villages, but you know, we'll just call them all cities. So the prosperity message is going to be big in the, the months to come. Um, so if you don't like that, then either adjust or be left behind. Yeah. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. Let me just interject there very quickly, because it, it's not about money and it's not about covetousness. It's about funding the kingdom. Okay, and that's why we need prosperity, that's why we need kingdom wealth, so that we can fund the kingdom, I use that analogy all the time, so we can go buy Sky TV, we can go buy uh, all these different channels, and, and take all the, the filth and junk off them, and put the gospel on. And if people say, well, there's nothing left to watch except the gospel, they'll watch it. <laughs> Amen? Anyway. And, and here's what I want to get into. This is, this is the bit I want to get into. Verse 18, then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? First of all, horns, or horn here used in the, the, this passage, horn, in the Hebrew it means powers, or authorities, or we would say a little bit like the metaphor for mountains, kingdoms, nations, empires, powers in the earth. Just like Babylon or Egypt or, you, you know, and in modern day terms, say France or the UK or the EU or America. Horns are powers, not necessarily always nations, but powers in the earth. For example, uh, you could maybe say feminism is a horn or socialism is a horn. All the isms are, are horns, but it, it can mean literal kingdoms, but it, but it means um, strongholds normally. Horns are normally used. In, the, in terms of, you would say, uh, empires, nations, kingdoms, powers that are against God, normally speaking. But, you know, the Bible speaks about our horn, which is our strength, our power. But in this context here, he says there's four horns. And it says, now we, we could, let, let, let's, let's just speculate what they could be. Because I believe there are layered meanings to this, and we need to understand this, folks. Let's just say media is a horn. Commerce is a horn. The business world, the banking world. Government is certainly a horn. Religion is a horn. Four horns in Scotland today. Let me ask you, what is the media doing for the kingdom of God in Scotland today? What is business doing? What is the government doing? And what is religion doing? I'm not talking about the true church. I'm talking about Catholicism and many other woke... Uh, Presbyterianism. Yeah. Even Presbyterianism. Many churches today are part of the problem, aren't they? But 
Four, this is what I want us to get to here. This is the important part. Four in Scripture, numbers have meaning, and four is a number that signifies the globe or the world, north, south, east, west. The four corners of the globe. So four here signifies globalism. Okay, so we could say it this way. These are the globalist powers that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Amen? What are the four horns that are arrayed against Scotland today, that are arrayed against Britain today? Globalism. Globalist powers. We would say Antichrist powers, Babylonian powers. Some scholars actually believe that this refers to the, the four empires of Daniel's vision, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Because in one sense or another, they all were against the Israel people of God. And in them is that spirit that opposes God's kingdom and God's kingdom people. But, that, but that's a historic thing. What do we take from this? That Zechariah was a prophet of the end times. The four horns is globalism. That's our enemy. You know, people talk about uh, the uh, Nicola Sturgeon and independence, but and the SNP. But the SNP are not a nationalist party or a nationalist movement. They're a globalist party masquerading as a nationalist party because they want to get the votes that will put them in power. Like, and what has been happening in the last two years that they can further the globalist agenda. Because don't believe the hype, Nicola Sturgeon, oh, she hates the Tories, she hates Boris, all this. Right? Everything that the UK government do, she's in lockstep with. Why? Because she's not obeying, you know, she's not uh, doing it for the good of Scotland. She's doing it because she obeys her globalist masters. She's in the thrall of the four horns. But folks don't like when you're as, as blunt as this. Oh, well, we shouldn't preach politics. This is way above politics. It's nothing to do with politics. This is speaking about what the Bible identifies as Babylon, Antichrist, Leviathan, all these names, the four horns. But what is God's response to this problem? Because you can see right now, these four horns, they have the, the globe, the planet, locked down in their power. With all the protocols that they have. And we're, we're now getting the, all the hints. And nobody's fooled anymore. You might not. You might be locked down for Christmas, people. Yep. That's the four horns, folks. You, you close the door and stay in, in when we tell you. You'll not be able to do what you want to do unless we tell you you can do it. And when you can do it. And where you can do it. Now, you might say, well, that's for the good of our health. After... The service, I will give you the laying on of hands to either cast that dumb spirit out of you or slap you. <laughs> if you really believe that governments have our benefit at heart. That, that Nicola Sturgeon and Boris Johnson and sleepy Joe Biden have our welfare at the foremost of their thinking. Come on, folks. Like we said, it's time to be awakened. And this is the book that will do it. And this is the place that you'll, you'll, you'll be awakened. Because we'll not be silenced. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. That's your answer? Four carpenters or... Joiners, as we call them in Scotland, four craftsmen, four guys that work with their hands. That's your answer to the globalist powers. That's your answer to the EU Babylon. That's your answer to uh, all that's going on in the earth. Four craftsmen? Yeah. What's going on, Lord? Have you lost your mind? Because <laughs> look what he says. Look at this. And I said, what are these coming to do? You and I would say the same. What good are they going to do, Lord? 
What are these coming to do? Look at, look at the four horns. Look at the powers arrayed against us. Look at the strength. Look at the domination. Look at the complete totalitarianism that the four horns represent and manifest in our midst. And you sent us four jaders. You sent us four white men, white man, sorry, white van men. Amen? Now, we're going to look at this word crass a bit, but let's just read on. So he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head. He's talking about the four horns. He said, there's a problem right there. The horns that scattered Judah. The horns that scattered Scotland. The horns that scattered the church in Scotland or in England or in America. But we're we're here talking about Scotland. These are the horns that scattered Scotland. These are the horns that broke the church in Scotland. So that two-thirds of folks, after they'd done with all the protocols, didn't come back. So that churches had to shut. Or when they did meet, they, they met under these protocols. Because the horn said, this is how you meet. And you can't sing. Now, I know we can sing again. Thank, thank, thank the horns for that. No. <laughs> you understand? These are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head. And that means depression. These are the horns that broke the spirit of the Scottish people and the church in Scotland. But the craftsmen are coming to terrify them. To strike terror in the hearts of those four horns powers. Governments. uh, Parliaments. Puppets of the globalist powers. The craftsmen are coming to terrify them. To cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. The craftsmen are coming, folks. So we need to ask, well, first of all, we need to understand these powers have scattered God's people, these horns. Church and nation. What was their purpose? To do that. To break the power of God's kingdom before it ever manifests. I watched a video uh, yesterday, um, and this was quite a fascinating video because it was one of these guys that was an insider. He was, he was a whistleblower type guy, and he said that quite some time ago, the elites, if you like, had all uh, been looking at scenarios that were going to happen in the future. And every single time they did this, it came out that inevitable and unavoidable that the Great Awakening was coming. And this, this was, this was the, the, the dark side, you would call this. They had done all, the, 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 they'd done all the, their, their models, computer models, different things, and other stuff. And they just could not escape the conclusion that people are going to be awakened, that God is going to move. So everything that's happening in the earth right now is not them trying to stop it because they know they can't, but they're trying to prolong it. Now, I believe, I, I, I've believed that from day one of this stuff. And it, it's becoming a conviction, and that, that video was a great confirmation. But you know, what's coming? Alex said it. It's coming soon. But we have to put our faith in that. We have to exercise faith. God is going to move in this dear land, as in days of yore. And Scotland's right at the very forefront of it. Scotland is the spear point of it. So that when it happens in Scotland, it'll burst forth into other parts of the world. The UK, British Isles, Europe, and and so on. I'm not saying God's not going to move in other places, but he's going to move here in a way that's going to blow our minds. I believe that. 
But four craftsmen. So what do these craftsmen symbolize? Well, there's a number of uh, things I want to speak about about that. That I feel that, that it's not just one of them is true, but because you think craftsmen, what, what, what's God thinking? Why, why are we not getting warrior angels? And mm-hmm. What about that angel that slew 185,000 in the Old Testament? Mm-hmm. He says, no, craftsmen. Craftsmen. But what does it mean? Well, one of the things it can mean is the ordinary and the lowly, i.e. not high-born or privileged or elite, just us. Just us. Craftsmen. Now, not everybody here has a trade. But, you know, and it's not about, are you a good joiner, are you a good plumber? It's not about that. He's talking about, it's not going to be somebody who's high-born or privileged and elite in the world system. That's one of the things that that can mean. But it can also mean creative people. Craftsmen are creative, aren't they? You look around this church and you think, what skill did it take to make that table? To to build that balcony, you know, or or, or to make this room so so wonderful acoustically. What skill did that take? And, you know, creative people and creativity. If you think back to Bezalel in the Old Testament, who was given the job of of making all the the, uh, the, the things for the, the, the tabernacle. God is into beauty, folks. He's not into mundane, ordinary, drab. He's into beauty. He fashioned every one of us, and we're all unique. Am I right? right. None of us, you know, God made no boring people. So if you're boring, you did it, not God. He didn't make mediocre, average, drab or ugly. Right. Nobody in the kingdom is ugly. None of God's creation, really. Now, what I want to speak about here, I want to get into this in a little bit of depth. The job of these craftsmen is to terrify. To terrify the globalist powers, strike terror into them. Oh, oh, they're, they're globalized. They're activated. They're awakened. That's why this whole thing... See, they counterfeit. The enemy counterfeits what God's doing. That's why we have this term, woke. Mm-hmm. Or you've got to be woke, man. Now, woke is just the counterfeit of awakened. Mm-hmm. Woke is uh, being darkened mm-hmm. in your psyche by the lies of the kingdom of darkness. But awakened is awakening to the light of the kingdom. And it says that these craftsmen will cast out or pull down the powers of the nations, will throw them down and destroy them, is what it means. So God has a plan, and we're going to look at that plan, and that plan involves this, and this this is the phrase. While these powers are trying to impose their totalitarian dictatorship on the people, the nations, and particularly upon the church, what is God's response? God is building. That's, right. That's what it's saying. It's saying these four, four horns, speaking of all over the globe, this is happening, but we're looking at Scotland today, but it's saying that God has, a, God has four craftsmen. So in other words, God has a worldwide, across the earth, response to this, and that response is, God is a builder. God is building something, folks. And what he's building is you and I. He's building us into something. If you turn to Ephesians chapter 2, there's a lot of scripture to look through here. I'm not going to be all that long, but I'll just rattle through it. I hope you can pick up. It's Ephesians chapter 2, and then it says here, verse 10, For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. So what he's saying is God is building. The craftsmen speak of building. Building what? Building a culture in society. Building a culture that is kingdom culture, not antichrist culture. Because the four horns are trying to impose their culture upon us. Political correctness. 
Um, their ideas on gender, their ideas on marriage, their ideas on sexuality, their ideas on race and all these different things. But God says, no, I've, I've got a kingdom culture and I'm building that. You know, it's not just enough folks to have churches full, revivals, healings, miracles, salvations. None of that will necessarily take a society. But when you change a culture, when you introduce a kingdom culture, which we had in Scotland for many years, we had in Britain. And this word workmanship here in Ephesians 2 verse 10 is poema in Greek, which we get the word poem from. Something that's crafted. Something that's made by an artisan or a craftsman. You are God's poem. You are God's workmanship. He's crafting you. And that's true of us as individuals. But you see, the problem with our Christianity is it's too individual-minded. We are the body of Christ. We collectively. A lot of our Christianity is about me, me, me. But it needs to be a we, we, we. Because we are his body. And we are his workmanship collectively. We are created, it says here, to do good works. So we're created to be craftsmen, to be artisans, to create life, if you like, a life that embodies the kingdom. A life that is lived in the power of the Spirit. A life of love. A life of power. A life of victory. We, the works that we do are to be... We, we enflesh, if you like, the kingdom. And our works reflect that. We are created to bring a kingdom culture to the environment and community that we live in. Your town, your city, your village. Craftsmen are those who create a, a culture, aren't they? You know, uh, church has a culture. And you know, you, this is a, a magnificent table. And you, you say, oh, it's lovely. But there are tables like this all over churches of a certain age. Because there's a cultural thing going on, isn't there? You know, you have culture, you have a church has its own culture. And I know you have a modern church, but a lot of modern church still has church culture. It's just that instead of having, you know, big oak pulpits or whatever, you've got wee lecterns. But it's still the same thing. Because there's a culture. And there's an etiquette. And there's protocols. Because all these things form culture. And culture shapes society. And society needs to be transformed. Our enemies know this. The four horns know this. So what they say is, well, you know, you said that male and female created he, them, but we're just going to introduce dozens of genders yeah. because we're changing culture. Yeah. And you may not believe it because you're too old, you grew up, you're, you're conditioned to believe what you believe, but your kids will believe. Yeah. Your grandchildren will believe. There's 78 genders. Right. Craftsman speaks of creating culture. They create a place for God in the earth. So God says, the four horns have besieged my people and besieged the nations. But you know what? You, you, you say, where's the tanks, Lord? Where's the... Where's the the, the bombers, and the Lord says, we'll, we'll just create a culture. We'll just build something. Right in the heart of it. And do you know what? But they'll persecute us. Yeah, that'll just make it stronger. Has there ever been a period of, in church history, where persecution and oppression and all of that didn't strengthen the church? <coughs> See, we want to live a persecution-free lifestyle where everybody loves us and comes to church and yeah. signs up to what we're doing. But that's not the way that you, no. you, you, you grow a kingdom, culture, and society. Mm. 
you have to take your lumps, folks. Now, you can, you, you can still believe for God to move mightily. I'm not saying we just, oh, let's just believe God. Let's just, let's just collectively now uh, believe God for great persecution. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> but what I'm saying to you is that the biggest part maybe of that equation of we overcame by the blood of the Lamb, they overcame by the word of their testimony and decreeing God's purpose on the earth. Maybe the biggest part of that is the third part. Yeah. They love not their lives unto the death. If your physical existence is more important to you than the advancement of the kingdom of God in society, and particularly at this time, you're not a kingdom person. Believers are those who are called to bring a kingdom culture to earth. Uh, just very quickly, Isaiah 51, verse 16. I've put my words in your mouth. And again, if you read the context, it's in the context of the people of God being oppressed by oppressive power, by the four horns. It doesn't mention the four horns by, by that term, but you'll see it's clearly the same thing, that oppressors are in the midst trying to shut down the people of God, trying to wreak havoc upon society and change it into an antichrist culture. But he says, my response is, I've put my words in your mouth, Isaiah 51, 16. I've covered you with the shadow of my hand. In other words, I've given you my word. I've given you my spirit that I may plant the heavens. And that word plant can mean establish and lay the foundations of the earth and say to Zion, you are my people. You are my people. Folks, that's the message today. We are his people. And what he's saying to us is this, is that he's called us to establish the kingdom of heaven and the earth and lay foundations. Who does that? Craftsmen. Craftsmen. People who work with metal, wood, stone. Now, it's not just meaning literally that, so oh, I don't have a trade, so I don't qualify. No, he's talking metaphorically. He's saying that you have a job in God's kingdom to help him build his house. What is God building, folks? God's answer to the globalist project that is hostile to his people is to build. So what is he building? He's building a house. And we are, we are his house. He's building a house. We are God's workmanship. We've seen that. But also he's building a city. The house will grow to become a city. We've spoke about this. New Jerusalem, the cuboid. So each one of us is a lively stone, a living stone. And we're in the house. And, and we're maybe part of a house. You can say that when we talk about churches, we talk about them as house. Houses, don't we? But all that collectively comes together to become a city. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10, it says, uh, Abraham was looking for a city whose builder, whose builder and maker is God. And that word builder in the Greek, technetes, means artisan or craftsman. That's what it means. God is the artisan, the craftsman, the builder who's building a city. His project is the New Jerusalem. And that's an eternal city. The Bible, Stevie said it, was it last week? We're not going to go there. We're already there. We've, we have come to this city. We have come to the New Jerusalem. We're already part of it. We're already stones in it. And, and what the Lord is saying is, oh, it's already accomplished eternally, but it has to manifest on the earth. That's your job. Yeah. So you have to be a craftsman. But it's already, it's already an eternal reality, but just make it, make it real enough. Manifest it. How do we do that? By believing it. By speaking it. And watch this. God's answer to those who, came, who come against us is to build a city. Now the word city is the Greek word polis. And no, it's not the polis. <laughs> As in police. Uh, it's, but we get the word, and this is a dirty word I suppose, we derive the word from it. It's politician. <laughs> that, that's the, the root of politician. It's this word polis, and it means city. 
And then the Bible says, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Let's just go there very quickly. We've got a little bit of time left. A couple of hours. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3 says, and verse 20 says, watch this. It says, For our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. What he's saying is, you are part of a city. You're part of a city. And folks, that city covers the whole earth with not just one purpose, because God has greater purposes, but one of its purposes is this, to terrify the forehorn. The four wow. You're in a city that they're terrified of and doing everything they can to stop manifesting in the earth. Do you understand that? Our citizenship is in heaven or from heaven. So what it means is, even if they kill us here, well, we've already, you know, yeah. it's gravy. <laughs> it's win-win. We either accomplish what God has sent us to do here on earth, or we go to heaven, but, but it's profit either way. And we will accomplish collectively, corporately, the church of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, the saints of the Most High, shall possess the kingdom. So our citizenship is in the victory side. It's in a city that is victory. Our citizenship is in heaven. Now, look what Paul says. I'm just going to zip around some scriptures here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. What's all this got to do with the church? Everything. Watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And then verse 9 says, We are God's fellow workers... You are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given to me, Paul says, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another build on it. And he's, So Paul's saying, as an apostle, I'm a wise master builder. And that's another Greek word. Architect is the word that, in English that we get from it. From it. The arts tecton. Tecton is a build that's another that's similar to the one that we looked at for builder, but it means a master builder or an architect, somebody who sees the end from the beginning. Architects see the building before any, before any soil is dug up to lay the foundations. Architects see it and they put it in a blueprint and sometimes they do drawings of it and Surprisingly, the drawing looks just like the, the completed building. Why? Because they have that vision. They see the end from the beginning. And that's what the Bible says. Fathers who see the end, don't they? They, see the end, they know him who's from the beginning. And they see the end. They see the teleos point because they have that vision of the building inside them. Paul says, I'm a wise master builder. And that leads us to this... Uh, thought which we can close pretty much now with in Ephesians chapter 3 what is God building? He's building a house, he's building a city who's he building it with? His fellow workers his fellow craftsmen that's you and I, in other words the answer to the four horns is God is building his ecclesia but he's building his kingdom as well you see, the ecclesia is the collective of saints that meet together for the purpose of bringing God's purpose into the earth. And the ecclesia is to shape and mold society so that society conforms to the kingdom image, so that we live in the house of God here on earth, which is not just our, ch our church meeting, but it's something mystical because, because it's also in heaven. But that then brings the kingdom, the dominion of God, into society, into our cities and towns and our environment, and transforms them. Wow. So that all things are brought under his dominion. And as he says that, in Philippians there, it says, so that we might subdue all things. Amen. So what God is saying is, it might not look like an army. It might not look like we're at war. It may not even look like we're on the victory side, but what I'm building will result in victory and all things be subdued under the power of God's kingdom and God's church. Wow. And did you know that the word city in the Greek 
The root of it means battle or war, a victory won. See, the city God is building is a victorious city. Because we're, we're not trying to get at the victory, but the captain of the Lord's host has already won the victory. So we build on victory. We don't build towards victory. We build on victory. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Ephesians chapter 3, we'll close with this last couple. Verse 19 says, uh, sorry folks, Ephesians chapter 2 it is. My apologies. Ephesians chapter 2. It's verse 19. Then he said, he's saying this. Now, therefore, you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. And that's the Greek word, sampolites, which means you're a native of the same town. You're a native of the same city. You're a citizen of the same city with the saints and members of the household of God. You see, this is all about identity. Identity is everything. If you're part of God's house and you're a citizen of God's city, then you're, you're already on the victory side. You're already ruling and reigning with him in heavenly places. And that's also in this chapter. Watch this. Having been built, and again that's past tense, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, God is building, remember, being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. What God is building terrifies the four horns and will ultimately destroy them. Wow. He, a, he is the architect, the arch builder, the one with the vision, the one with the plan, and he shows us that plan in the New Jerusalem. And he put that plan in Abraham's heart. So Abraham's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And we have a, a greater maybe concept of it because we, Abraham didn't have revelation to read. What does this tell us to wrap this up? It's telling us that this whole thing, the four craftsmen, is all about apostolic and prophetic ministry because this building is built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. And you know, that's the, the, the two ministries, the two ministries that the church shunned for years and said had ceased. No more apostles, no more prophets, plenty of evangelists, plenty of pastors, plenty of teachers, apostles and prophets. But thank God for the grace of God that the Lord released the truth of apostles. Not, not to Bill Johnson, these guys in America, praise God, they, they, they're, they're in apostles. But to the apostolic church here in the UK. That's right. In Wales, here in Scotland, just, just down the road. Right. Uh, Pastor Turnbull. Right. Men of God grasping this truth. Yes, Pentecost, wonderful, we, we, we celebrate it. But to the apostolic church. Mm -hmm. I always love plugging the apostolic church for God gave this revelation. And that was a pioneer, wasn't it? That was a forerunner of this apostolic. People were walking in that minute. John Alexander Dowie was walking in apostolic ministry. A man built a city called Zion. But it was that revelation of apostolic and prophetic ministry that came back into the body of Christ. Apostles and prophets. Let's just do a final verse that we'll look at as we close this, folks. Revelation 18, verse 20. Because we're talking about the fall of Babylon. We're talking about the four horns being destroyed. We're talking about their fall and God, people having triumph over them. But Revelation chapter 18 is all about this. About the fall of Babylon. It says it will happen in one day. And then it narrows it down and says, in one hour, in one day, the system will come to nothing. And look what it says, Revelation 18. It says, that they're saying verse 19, Alas, alas, that great city, that's Babylon, 
Or you could say that's the final expression of the four horns. And folks, that's in the earth today. As Alex said, this stuff's happening soon. In which all the ships in the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she is made desolate. There's coming a day very soon in one day. One day and in one hour in that day. I don't know how that will happen. But it says Babylon will fall completely. She's made desolate. And then look at this verse. Rejoice over her, O heaven. And you holy apostles and prophets. For God has avenged you on her. What he's saying is, the apostles and prophets. I get the privilege of preaching this in the apostolic church. Loved it. The apostles and prophets are involved in the fall of Babylon. Why? Because they are the ones that the foundation is laid upon. Why? Because God has a building project. And that building project is designed to build his city in the earth. To build his kingdom in the earth. And it's just going to be too much for Babylon to handle. They know that already. Every desperate move and measure that they make now to try and shut down that message from going out. To shut down people to being awakened. This includes the great harvest, the end time harvest. The wealth of a nation shall come to you. That's not just riches. That Greek word, sorry, the Hebrew word is kyle, and it means people, multitudes, hosts, armies, people pouring in to God's kingdom, people pouring in to church, people pouring in to the ecclesia yeah. and the kingdom. Mm-hmm. Vast hosts and multitudes of people, nations and multitudes are our destiny. Mm-hmm. And let me just say this to you. That word technology, the word technology, we get that from these Greek words. Techni, technities, tecton. Technology. What's he saying here? To sum this up. The technology of glory, the technology of heaven, is what God will employ and deploy to pull Babylon down. Okay, the technology comes from two Greek words. That word tech, which means artisan or craftsman. And the logos. So God will use his logos. And people who know how to use it. Craftsmen. Preachers of the word. People who can wield this as a weapon. Like Nehemiah. A sword in one hand. A shovel in the other. Building something. But also destroying the enemy. God is looking for craftsmen. She's looking for to sign apprentices into this. Amen. Because he wants to release glory technology into our lives Amen. that will build his city, Amen. but also pull down the four horns, the Antichrist powers, Babylon, and the earth. Amen. The Lord bless you, folks. Amen.